I certainly wasn't going to go through 500 cases in 10 minutes. So what I'm going to do this morning is try and provide you with a flavor of some of the different cases we've been doing at Stanford um, and sharing some cases from my colleagues from around the country of how we actually practically implement the use of FFR angio. <clears throat> so we saw a similar slide from uh, Dr. Samuels. We know that FFR angio provides us with a more practical method for performing FFR assessment with a very high diagnostic accuracy, as Bill showed us with the data that sort of underpinned this technology to date. And the hope is that this may translate, given that it's more practical, convenient, and time efficient, into a greater adoption of physiological guidance for PCI decisions, which we know results in improved clinical outcomes. And this is in keeping with the guidelines, as Bruce showed, not just in the United States, but around the world. In addition, FFR angio can be used with any angiogram, the caveat being, as uh, Bruce said, garbage in, garbage out, that it's a quality angiogram, to try and leverage that information we get from FFR physiology for decisions that are broader than just simply wire-based FFR, and I'll try and show you some examples of that. <clears throat> so the system uh, from CathWorks received approval in 2018. More than 500 cases have been done to date. From a practical perspective, it's compatible with all commercially available CR machines that we all use um, in our cath labs, which makes it very practical and convenient. And depending on your lab setup, uh, irrespective of that lab setup, it's very easily integrated into whatever system you have. So there's no need for change in the existing infrastructure. So it's very seamless in terms of its integration into your workflow with minimal disruption, and actually arguably an improvement in workflow and efficiency overall. This is an example of use at Stanford Medical Center. Um, we have uh, two rooms where we utilize it. In one room, the uh, data automatically pushes to the CathWorks system. In the other, it needs to be manually done. It's a very quick process. And then depending on your setup at your institution, um, either the attending can do it. We can cover the uh, module with um, clear plastic so that you can stay sterile and still compute, um, or the fellow can scrub out. Or having said that, if you don't have fellows, a tech can learn it very easily. Uh, it's very intuitive. The learning curve is short. I'll show you a slide about the proposed learning curve. Um, and really, there's minimal interruption to the workflow and resulting in a speedy and efficient uh, delivery of care. So as I mentioned, the learning curve, only about five cases. Um, and I can say, you know, having done this, uh, I agree with this. It takes five cases really to get uh, familiar with the system in terms of understanding the sequence of clicks, understanding that you need a good quality angiogram to start with and then a good quality tracing, but thereafter it's very quick, very intuitive in terms of performing the actual analysis. So looking at some cases now, uh, this is a case from May. Uh, the initial FFR angio was 0.78. Um, you can see there three good quality projections. Um, I would argue the other sort of tangible benefit of this is that I think it improves the quality of diagnostic angiography. One of my pet peeves is poor quality diagnostic angiograms and certainly because this system relies on good quality angiograms and appropriate projections, I think at least when teaching the fellows, it encourages them uh, and in fact all of us to try and take better quality, ang quality angiographic images. So that's sort of one of the halo effects, of you, if you like, uh, in addition to the direct tangible effects. Um, the other advantage is that we no longer, you don't need to rewire. Um, we all know that the uh, wired FFR systems are not the best in terms of initial wiring of lesions, particularly complex uh, lesions or very tortuous or calcified vessels, and certainly not the most ideal wires on which to work to deliver a balloon stents or, or other hardware. The benefit of this, of course, is that we all take routine post-intervention pictures, and then we can perform a post-PCI FFR angio to assess for the uh, improvement in physiology to ensure that we have actually had a positive result. A lot of the potential criticisms of the system is, well, it takes a long time. I don't have time. It's going to add time to my workflow. I was at dinner last night uh, speaking to a colleague of mine down in Southern California uh, who has just started using the system and said, well, I'm not sure how it's going to work because it's going to take a lot of time. So this is a, a case example, again, done in late May. The FFR angio result strongly positive at 0.64. The entire analysis took six minutes. So that's from first click to an output from the algorithm uh, with that strongly positive uh, FFR angiogram. Correlated that with an IFR wire, 0.91. So one of those examples of discordance there. That analysis took 13 minutes. And then when we compare that to the more traditional FFR wire with hyperemia, uh, result of 0.77, but the anal analysis took 16 minutes. Now, you could argue that perhaps the IFR and FFR times are a little long there, but still I think based on our experience that six minutes for the FFR angio is probably in the ballpark of, of what is appropriate. Um, so clearly not increasing the time taken to, to perform this and certainly a lot more information gleaned. Um, 
Third case here is asymptomatic 71-year-old gentleman. So again, the FFR angio here, 0.79, sort of in that borderline. The analysis there took only four minutes. I think that was probably one you did, Bill, because it's a lot faster. Um, <laughs> and the IFRY there, 0.9, that analysis took 11 minutes because this is early in the experience when we're sort of still um, looking for concordance or discordance between the, the various modalities. And of course, given the patient was asymptomatic and it was borderline, uh, the decision was made not to intervene there. But again, just confirming that this is not something that's going to delay the workflow and instead integrates quite nicely and is very efficient. What about sizing? Well, we know as uh, interventional cardiologists, our sort of ocular reflex and ocular assessment is not good. We've known that for quite some time. And it works both ways in terms of the severity of lesions, but also determining the size of a vessel we want to intervene on or the length of a disease segment we wish to intervene on. And Potential complications or um, adverse consequences of this are uh, increased rates of intermittent hyperplasia, of course, catastrophically potential coronary rupture, restenosis and stent thrombosis, particularly restenosis, and then additional unnecessary uh, stents that are used because you missed the original lesion or didn't uh, um, appreciate the true length of this disease segment. And so the FFR size tool, I'll just play this video, um, allow, allows us to integrate not just the physiological information, but also give some guidance as to the appropriate luminal size of the vessel to try and help guide appropriate stent sizing selection. In addition, using the pullback tools I saw, you saw from um, my colleague just earlier, um, helping you to delineate where you should start and where you should stop, particularly in those cases where we don't have a clear focal type A lesion with normal vessels surrounding it. And so that's quite useful, bringing in some of the benefits that we see at least with the use of IVUS and OCT and integrating that with physiology here to guide the decision-making process. And you can see they're placing that virtual stent to overlie that area and try and approximate uh, whether you'll be covering the lesion. So this is an example of this technology in use, 77-year-old uh, woman with unstable angina and a history of ischemic heart disease. You see there the coronary angiogram, there's diffuse disease in the LAD, quite a large sized caliber diagonal vessel, um, uh, sorry, ramus. Um, so the phys physician estimation in this case was a proximal diameter of three millimeters and a length of 15 millimeters. And in the distal segment, uh, an estimation of a diameter of 2.75 millimeters and a length of 20. With the FFR angio estimation, the proximal diameter was actually a lot less at 2.4. The length was uh, pretty much the same. And the distal stent, also a smaller vessel um, with slightly longer length. And so two stents were inserted based on the physician's assessment and the stents were clearly oversized in those segments you can see there. And we often see this in practice, the creation of a new lesion between the two. Um, and so a third stent needed to be inserted in order to ensure that the final angiographic result was satisfactory. Um, and you can see there after stenting that mid lesion, the FFR there is 0.83 um, and then, sorry, prior to stenting the mid lesion and then after the placing the stent between the two initial stents, 0.97. So arguably an unnecessary third procedure there with the third stent. So um, utilizing this to size the vessel and also assess for the length of the lesion will certainly improve workflow and efficiency. And if you sort of expand this over a large number of cases, potentially also the uh, economic impact. This is a case of stent length underestimation. So a 64 year old with angina and diabetes, the physician estimate was a diameter of three and a length of 18. Based on the FFR angio system, the estimation of diameter was correct, but the length was much longer at 26. So once again, based on the physician's assessment, a second, uh, shorter stent was placed and a second stent was needed to cover the distal lesion. Um, you see there on the uh, pullback, the residual lesion with a clear drop in the uh, FFR. And so a second stent needed to be placed with appropriate resolution then of the FFR uh, with to 0.98. So again, an improvement in workflow and clinical outcomes. This is a case shared um, by one of my colleagues on Twitter um, recently, and so he was kind enough to send them, Dr. Narula from San Diego. So this is uh, the coronary tree. You can see there the lesion in the LAD, uh, appropriately mapped out, nice angiographic images and three variable projections there. The FFR was strongly positive at 0.6. You can see there a clear uh, step up or step down, uh, depending on which way you're looking at it in that uh, proximal to mid segment. A stent was placed and then in his practice, he OCTs quite frequently. You can see there that there is a stent edge dissection. Now debating the uh, issue of whether we stent stent edge dissections or not is beyond the scope of this talk. But what he decided to do was you do a post uh, 
angio FFR to assess for the physiological significance of this. And so he did that in his post PCI FFR is 0.99. And given that he elected to leave that uh, stent edge dissection alone. So it's a slightly different application for the use of the technology. So I think where we are at now is this sort of comparison between conventional wire-based FFR, which has been the mainstay of physiological assessment for some time, and where we are now with FFR angio uh, in the modern era. As I said, it's very easy to integrate. Um, it works with existing cath lab hardware and software. There's a clear um, pathway for reimbursement and profitability. There's already established reimbursement code. There's also a cost saving with the lack of need for uh, the wire and of course hyperemic agents such as adenosine. The time needed as I demonstrated in those real life cases is less in fact than the traditional methods of either IFR or FFR. And of course, based on the same premise that we saw from FAME onwards, an improved quality of care, lower cost of care, reduced risk, and ultimately improved clinical outcomes. As I said, and Bruce alluded to this earlier, the quality of the angiogram and the projections really determines the quality of the output from the algorithm. And so a good quality angiogram during the procedure will result in a higher diagnostic accuracy, including those patients who are in that gray zone that Bill showed us, a very fast processing time and really minimal workflow disruption, and multi-vessel assessment and single analysis, as well as the ability to very quickly and accurately do both the pre and post procedural analysis. And so in summary, it's easily integrated into routine clinical practice. Our experience and that of other people who are using it now routinely shows very high concordance between the FFR angio and traditional FFR. It has a very wide patient and lesion applicability as we've seen in some of my colleagues' talks earlier and provides comprehensive information and reduced procedure time, making it the preferred method over wire-based FFR. Thank you. <laughs>